Monkey is swallowing. Snake says swallowing. Next, a swallow too will fly and come and swallow. You ever swallow in a hollow galu. Making a whole lot of halabalu. Jale kalu. We know say you chop the money some, so give me the loot. Do you really want a revolution or just your turn? Cause if you really want a revolution, all this for Ben. Hello everyone. Welcome to AK Arts and Book Festival 2020 online. My name is Charles Idem. I'll be moderating a panel with Titi Akinsomi, Timi Giwa Tuboson, and Timi Ajiboye on how efficiently can technology solve Africa's problems. Panel members, welcome to Ake Festival. Do you want to say hi quickly? Thank hi. you for having us. Hi. Fantastic. Okay, so let's just jump straight into it. Um, as I said, the topic of the conversation is how efficiently can technology solve Africa's problems? Before we dive into it, let's spend the first two minutes on introductions. Tell us um, about what you do, and then we can jump into talking about the substance of you know what we're here to do today. Temi, Titi, do any of you want to go first? My name is Temi Giwatu Bosu. I work at LifeBank. LifeBank is a medical distribution company. We uh, optimize our distribution system using technology. We call ourselves the business of saving lives. That's us. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Titi? Hello everyone, my name is Titi Akisami. I call myself a policy wonk. I am in the business of technology, digital economy, label you want to be able to put to it. And I've been doing this for a number of years now. It's absolutely unbelievable. For me, it's about being able to respond to the gap in regulatory spaces and policy spaces and helping really diverse, otherwise not really interested in working together, people work together. Fantastic. Thanks for that. We'll come back to the policy side of things soon. Uh, Timmy, do you want to just say a few words? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Timmy Ajibwe. I guess at my core is software developer. Um, currently, I run a startup called Bycoins, and we're a cryptocurrency exchange. Make it easier for people to buy and sell crypto in, in Nigeria and soon to be the rest of the continent. Fantastic. Now that's, that's an emerging space which we'll be keeping an eye on for the next few years. Let's get straight into this. Um, I think to set this stage, I'll, can I just ask you, uh, there's been talk for maybe the last two decades about Africa leapfrogging development, you know, because obviously there was a gap or there was a period where a lot of African countries um, didn't get the right investments in infrastructure. Um, but then today we have the proliferation of mobile phones, we have um, mobile, mobile money expanding, and obviously the internet penetration of the continent is increasing year on year. In terms of this topic, how efficiently can technology rather solve Africa's problems? Um, can you just tell us what are the problems from your perspectives and from the sectors you work in um, that we still see? And to what degree um, are we seeing technology addressing those problems? Um, who wants to go first, please? So I definitely think that the internet being so like commonplace now has helped us in specific ways. Um, but we still have generally broadly, especially in Nigeria, we still have like huge gaping infrastructural issues that I think that um, the internet can help with what we have to be intentional about. You know, things are so much easier now in certain regards, say, you know, information spreading, Everyone gets news really quickly. We see things happening, you know, even in the government real time. People can send money. People can also learn really fast. But roads are still bad, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, we still don't have electricity, right? And that's because uh, physical problems are much harder to solve than software problems. However, I, I think the path to this would be to have more educated and more wealthy Nigerians, for example. And I think the internet can be a good way to do that you know to help spread education most of everything i know i learned on the internet um and there are people working on this uh one of the ones that i, I particularly find interesting is called new lesson and um they're teaching i'm, I'm sure uh <laughs> so knows about it. yeah uh you know and i also think that the, the internet's uh ability to let us export a certain kind of labor will also create a new generation and i myself i'm i'm an example of this i, I used to freelance and i used to um write code for people all over the world that i would never meet 
So, you know, there are all kinds of things from writing to there's, there's all sorts, cosmos mm -hmm. and everything. So I think we've moved fast with certain things, but the rest have to will take a long time before we can have educated, wealthy, and maybe hopefully even politically powerful Nigerians that will now actually fix the roads, for example. So that's kind of my, my view on, on some of these things. Interesting. Yeah. I'll come back to the, you mentioned education, then we'll come back to that theme um, sub later yeah. on. But let's, let me just go to um, Timmy. Timmy, you work in a very interesting space. I think it's an intersection of healthcare and logistics. Um, and, and Timmy mentioned roads there. <laughs> roads are a big issue. I mean, yeah. in Africa, you know, across different countries, we still hear governments talk about fixing roads um, mm. and, and stuff like that. So mm. can you tell us from your perspective, and maybe share an anecdote if you can about how you you know challenge that you still face in your industry um, mm. from deficient technology that we have in Africa? Mm. You know, it, it's real. The work we do uh, sort of like takes healthcare, uh, logistics, technology, and sort of fuses it together. And we get, you know, we're trying to solve a problem that's in healthcare, but because of lack of infrastructure, we end up having to be the infrastructure and, and deal with whatever roads we have. Uh, we operate in five uh, states across Nigeria with a hub in two other states. So at any given time, we have trucks, uh, motorcycles, mini tricycles going around in Nasarawa, in Portacot, in Bayelsa, in Lagos, Ibadan. So we kind of have a sense of what's happening in the entire country uh, in terms of the infrastructure. And it's really very similar across board. Uh, lack of excellent infrastructure affects everything we do. I was recently telling someone that the rain is starting, you know, there's bottles everywhere, you know, pockets and chain budget is going to go up. So I literally was like calculating the math in my head and that's really what it takes. Um, you know, we, you know it's, it's real. And yeah. it's granular, and we deal with it every day um, yeah. in in our in our work. Interesting. So the inefficiencies really have an impact on the bottom line. Absolutely, um, and that's real for for most businesses. Okay, we'll come Absolutely. back to to that. Um, Titi, just from your perspective, you, you talk you mentioned that you're a policy work. I know you work at Google today. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot that you do that also you know cuts across this topic. So can you just tell us from your perspective as well, and maybe share a story or an anecdote where you know you've you've had to experience the inefficiencies and and unfortunately maybe technology was not able to to help surmount that so yeah thank you thank you very much um Charles. so sincerely technology can i always say this technology can solve all the problems okay technology cannot solve all the problems Fair that's also reality as long as there's the human factor we will face inefficiencies in technology uh, whether you're talking about cybersecurity or putting the right policies in place or dealing with the reality of real life, meaning in person life, like the sports and chains that Tammy has to consider, um, even though she's running an organization that technically should not be thinking way too much about that. So, you know, to in terms of anecdotes, I, early on in my, in my career or in my life, not even before I actually formally started working, um, I realized that there's a huge gap a major thing around skill set. Oh. Um, and that's something that was a function of the way that policies were put in place around what you could study or not. Oh. Uh, so a lot of people don't realize a lot of assumptions that are made that, you know, I probably study computer science, etc. Actually, no, my first degree is in English. Right. Right? Not computer science, not in any way related to technology. And for anybody who grew up in the community in the educational system in Nigeria, which I grew up in, immediately you know that I was exposed to nothing that was remotely connected to computers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so here I am in my third year of university, and I share this very deliberately, and I realized I was getting into the point where I would have a, I would get into the workforce. Mm -hmm. And the last time I technically touched a computer was when I was learning MS-DOS. And here I was going into <laughs> a space that would include broadcasting and all such. And I just didn't have that understanding. And that for me mm. is always at the back of my mind when I think about the 800 million plus Africans who are not in any way connected to the internet. Mm. But at the same time, I think about the 400 plus, mm. 400 million plus who think they are connected, but actually don't have the requisite skills to be able to make the best use or access services like mm. either Timmy or Tammy are given out 
through their businesses. So in its own way for me, there's a, you know, there's a video that I'm, I will be sharing that speaks to what my day job, and I deliberately say that, that I have a day job where I work with, not with, not for, uh, Google, um, where we have an opportunity to be able to impact lives in many ways. So that video actually speaks to Africans' experiences once they come in touch with our technology. Okay. Thanks for that, Timmy. Uh, Titi, sorry. We'll get to that video um, later on. But let me come back to Timmy now. I, there's a lot of T's here. In fact, I'm the only person who's yeah, so awesome. far. <laughs> exactly. I this, that. this is the only panel, I'm sure, in our Kia Festival where this is happening. So <laughs> tell me, just in terms of your space, now you talked about you know being self taught right um and obviously now you're running your business after developing your skills yourself on this subject of education um you know and you have all touched on it in one way or another we have 800 or a billion, almost a billion people on the continent you said technology can solve some problems but not all of the problems so you know we still have a lot of fundamental problems here how can we leverage technology to improve education what can you tell us from your personal experience and just from what is out there um there's quite a number of factors here um there is access and you know access could be you know it's power related you know you need electricity to use the internet um and you need internet connection and then and there needs to be uh a good amount of infrastructure for for people to have internet especially in like rural places However, I just by nature tend to be an optimist. And I think that there are technologies that really excite me. And broadly, what this ends up meaning is that the more people have the internet, we can exponentially affect the lives of more and more people. So I always say this to my housemates, where it's like, we need to create more 10,000 X people. Mm -hmm. I went to Unilag, there's nothing really particularly special about my life. I dropped out, I don't have a degree. But somehow, because of the internet, I'm able to actually directly impact the lives of thousands of people, either by things I write and just publish, or even through my startup, because, you know, through Bitcoin, people make money and they can feed their families and whatever. So I think that what anybody who I guess is interested in kind of like our progress needs to focus on is how can we increase access and there are many 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 different ways um uh, one way i like to talk about a lot is increasing the wealth of those that currently have access today right mm -hmm. so um i have two siblings um uh, i'm even at my sister's house right now my sister is a writer she freelances for companies all over the world my brother he lives in yaba too we've all moved out and he um uh, makes uh, virtual reality experiences and video games for somewhere, someone in Chicago or something, I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. So, and there's really not, we didn't grow up rich, we weren't poor, but we didn't, there's nothing special about our lives except that um, I love computers, I love the internet. My sister is a, not a computer nerd, she doesn't, any small thing to me, how do I do this? Um, <laughs> but she writes, she writes, she lives in Korea, she writes, she wakes up every morning really early and writes and makes a living. She lives on her own and she, she funds herself. And as a result, now she has the wealth to say, maybe invest, invest in my next startup, which could be like an ISP, for example, right? So we have an ISP and it's cheap and affordable, more people can learn. I just want to essentially create more people who can have some of the experience I did because I found the internet. The internet is the biggest source, like the freest, most powerful way human beings have ever connected in the history of mankind. And we need to spread that as broadly as possible and then you know there's things to be said about you know internet proliferation and the cost of it but yeah, yeah technology gets into the point where some of those things are seemingly easier for example uh elon musk company spacex is launching twelve thousand satellites uh -huh. um into space to cover the earth with uh -huh. internet so you know yeah. maybe there's something someone can do there to give yeah. more nigeria's internet and even if it's just Hundred thousand people that have internet. If those people are ten thousand people, like you know, ten thousand people, they can influence that. So yeah, I, I really think we should just try as much as possible to give people the kind of skills that they can sell for USD, right? <laughs> Interesting point. Let me let me talk. Yeah. Let me ask Timmy about this this uh, this topic. Uh, this point you made about access. 
Um, Timmy, obviously, access has increased across you know the continent, um, especially across Nigeria. Um, do you see, from your perspective, um, that having an impact on um, people who you serve? Um, are they able to to request your services uh, more because they have access, or how, how has that affected your customers, or has that affected your business? You know, like uh, Timmy was saying, it's clear that. Um, there's still a wide swath of, you know, Nigeria that does not have access to the internet. And like I always say, healthcare is always the last one to get innovation because, you know, we have to be careful because we're dealing with a human body. Uh, internet, uh, healthcare access within the hospital system in Nigeria is still behind. So what do we do as a startup? We need to reach hospitals. Hospitals need to be able to reach us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, so when we launched, you know, five years ago, LifeBank was supposed to be just like, you know, a web application where hospitals can request, you know, the critical supplies they need. And it, it simply didn't work because they didn't have access to good internet. Uh, so we needed to sort of adjust, uh, build a call center and really give them what they need. However, so the way we're using internet is to, or, or technology or innovation, um, is to basically optimize our own supply chain uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that even if our customers are not, you know, coming to us using the internet, when we are delivering services to them, there is, you know, technology allows us to deliver it faster, cheaper, and safer. Uh, for example, we're using things like blockchain to oh. bring efficiency to the blood system, to track blood and track blood safety, uh, to be able to sort of like track, you know, uh, so if, if, you know, the blockchain is very long and there are multiple players in there. Can we make sure that there's transparency into that in that system powered by blockchain? Uh, we use data science to make sure that we can predict uh, demand for these resources. And uh, so we're doing quite a lot of these things using high tech, but we're able to deliver these services to our customers using low tech. And the reality is just, you know, uh, when if you want to deliver, you know, like I always say, the internet is not going to help you deliver blood to uh, you know, a hospital in Bayelsa. You still literally need physical things to move and distribute blood and, and oxygen, et cetera. But in, the internet makes it easier, makes it cheaper to right. be able to optimize your delivery, know when, when demand is going to occur so you can get ahead of that demand. And mm -hmm. it really actually helps people. So if a woman is bleeding and I know she's gonna, you know, let's say a woman you know, needs to have a baby, um, and I know that she has a delivery date. If I have her uh, medical history, I can predict if she's going to need blood. I can get the blood to the hospital where she needs it ahead of time. And that's what the internet helps us do. Um, you know, uh, Titi is on this call. I remember we partnered with Google Maps uh, yeah. to better optimize our delivery routes, particularly right. in Lagos, and get ahead of traffic. Using Google Maps has actual real-life effects on people. Right. Because if I can cut just five minutes from our it's delivery time, time, that's yeah. literally someone's life that gets saved. So wow. for me, I think that internet, you know, technology, innovation does help people um, and does even if they don't have access with the way we're using innovation, we're able to affect their lives positively. Right. Fantastic. That's, that's very powerful. Um, Titi, Tibi mentioned optimizing supply chains. Um, so we find that uh, businesses or entrepreneurs have to really innovate around their industries um, because I guess the public infrastructure is not available. What are some of the, the challenges um, that I guess from your perspective you see today to, to public infrastructure improving? I mean, there's technology available now. Why is the public sector not able to leverage the technology? to improve the public infrastructure so that entrepreneurs like Timmy and Timmy don't have to build, or I guess partner with their colleagues to build infrastructure for their own industries. What are the challenges that are hindering this from happening? You know, earlier on, I did say that technology can solve all problems. Mm -hmm. Technology cannot solve all problems. I think that's just a human factor. I try to let people know that I don't say that just to be trite but because it is reality. So you can have all the greatest innovations happening, right? But if it's happening in an environment or in an ecosystem, if you permit me to use that word, 
where it does not enable or support the actual innovation, it will not thrive. Mm. So why is this not happening? It's a range of reasons. I also have a, um, an academic background. And in my technology classes, where I would teach regulators and I'll teach ministers, etc. Um, I always had a slide where I showed technology as a hare, uh, a rabbit, and I would show government policies and regulations as a tortoise, a, a tortoise or a snail. Mm. And that's the reality that where innovation thrives, where technology is always at the forefront, moving on to the next thing and being able to solve problems, it has historically taken governments. And I mentioned governments particularly. I'm not going to talk about the rest of society or perceptions around culture that make people's work, like teams work around supporting women with law, the cultural norms that prevent that from even being able to take off. Or Timmy's work, where my, you know, my family asks, what do you mean cryptocurrency? What are you talking about? I don't see the money. Show me the money, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Let's not talk about those nuances yet. We're talking about the infrastructure. Well, you know, we, we typically think around fiscal infrastructure. But when you think about the government infrastructure that's supposed to enable prosper, mm -hmm. it takes a while for a lack of understanding, mm -hmm. a lack of cohesion. Um, and a lack of willingness to let go of spaces that historically have been monopolized in a way that benefited only a few. Mm. Now, I can speak just to the Nigerian case, but based on my experience, I can speak to this case any part in the world. It happens. Even in North America, even in the United States of America, look at the healthcare system, right? Mm. It looks like it's advanced, but take a step back and you realize that access to even the most innovative of technologies around medicine does not reach everybody. Not everybody has internet access, actually. If I give another example, Tammy mentioned being able to use Google Maps. I will tell you that right now, part of the technologies that we've made available freely as Google is plus code. And it's being used in Uter in the United States because there are communities there who don't have street names or addresses. Same as in the Gambia, mm -hmm. same as mm -hmm. if you walk into Wuse Market, mm -hmm. Same as if you walk into the townships in South Africa. So as such, in some cases, it's a lack of understanding of where they would need to put innovative technologies yes. that enable. You know, they don't quite fit in a box. Mm -hmm. Where do you fit? Mm -hmm. so this for me is, a, like I said, I'm a policy wonk, mm -hmm. right? For the digital economy. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency right now confuses people. Um, there was a recent set of rules and regulations, second level legislation that came out mm -hmm. looking to be able to regulate the cryptocurrency sector. Mm -hmm. But there's so much confusion if you read that law because you can tell that these guys don't really know how this thing works. Right. Mm -hmm. I remember earlier on in my career, we would say bridging the digital divide, mm -hmm. right? But part of bridging that divide is helping, and this is why I encourage start of founders and mm. leadership to understand that yes working with government is a pain being able to engage in the political process can be a pain mm. but if you want to build a sustained successful still here 10 15 years later business if it's part of your strategy because some people have a strategy where they want to be out of the business in three years mm. then you need to be able to take the time to, and these are my four words that I live my life by, inspire, inform, involve, and impact government. Otherwise, mm. firstly, they will show up with a content tax mm. or a <laughs> or that kind of tax that they will try and get yeah. into your business, right? Mm. The regulation, mm. Because they don't understand the yeah. value that you bring. So creating an understanding, helping to, to share what the value is, and then you will still meet roadblocks. But in meeting those roadblocks is where I then think that there needs to be better strength amongst those of us who are working in technology so that mm. we as Africans in Africa can actually make a difference. I just want to link that to something Timmy said earlier on. Timmy, you talked about wealth creation. Um, mm. Unemployment is one of the biggest problems we have on the continent. Uh, your, your startup helps people trade and, and obviously you have people who, who earn an income from trading. Would you say businesses like yours and, and you know, innovative ideas like you know, yours have helped address that problem of unemployment that we have? 
Um, and to what degree? Because we've seen in the last decade, maybe two decades, the proliferation of startups on the continent. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's definitely helping. Um, uh, if not for the internet, I certainly would be jobless. One thing about being in this space and, you know, all the excitement and innovation is that we forget that there's a lot of Nigerians and the Nigerian situation is actually pretty terrible. And, after, you know, I mean, when I say Nigeria, I mean the rest of Africa because there are some similarities. However, we're still very early stages. So I think that the ripple effect of some of the efforts that, you know, people like me are putting today and people who came before me, say, for example, uh, InterStreet existing 18 years ago, the ripple effect and the exponential progress, I think it's a 2030, I think, where it's people who are born 20 years from now that will not understand being in a world where you can't learn something, right? Because even when you think about, I, I guess even slightly more privileged people who say, for example, live in Lagos, you find kids not being able to conceptualize asking a question and there not being an answer at least five minutes away from them on, on the internet, or like they're not being able to watch a video for it. Like I said, making people wealthy, um, and I wrote an article about this actually, you know, building for the world. If you're in Africa, you should try to build for the world. Because, you know, living in Nigeria and earning forex, uh, it's better for Nigeria because you can now say, for example, hire more people. Uh, and when you do that, maybe buy smartphones for your driver so that he will use Google Maps and then maybe he will Google some stuff and figure out how to do forex. When I say wealth creation, I, I don't think it's for today. Mm. I think it's so that we can create more people like, I guess, us who mm. can affect the lives of thousands and thousands and millions of people. It's a long game. Uh, the mm -hmm. people who have brought Nigeria to where it is have done a pretty good job <laughs> of, of making things hard. And the thing is like, when I think about just the amount of, the best tool we have is tech at the internet. Like that's the only thing where um, you can actually reach the minds of millions of people. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be millions of people in Africa. Doing work that is recognized worldwide, if you have your priorities similar to mine, will, will also do good for, I guess, who? Right, fair point. Um, Timmy, how have you been able to scale what you've done um, in spite of the challenges that exist? Um, can you, what can you tell us about your experience? It's quite difficult. Uh, we. We started in Lagos and then we expanded to you know several other states in Nigeria, then moved to Kenya recently. For me, the way that I think about it is, you know, I'm a bit different from how Timmy approaches this work. I think the way that I approach the work is that I want to solve problems. Right? You know, I want to solve entrenched problems. I love what Timmy does. You know, creating wealth is really critical. That's how we're gonna, you know, permanently solve the issues that we have in our in our community. But to be quite honest, there has to be someone who does the sort of like the dirty work of just moving one thing from point A to point B around the clock at 3 a.m., you know, during public holiday. And for some reason, I feel called to do that kind of work. It's where I think my, you know, magic happens. You know, I just get so excited. My favorite way of describing what we do at Live Bank is silence infrastructure. And to be quite honest, uh, the way that we think about our Live Bank is we want to build silence infrastructure across Africa across yeah. developing countries where this problem exists, where infrastructure yeah. has been built. Yeah. We want to build that, you know, supply chain system yeah. as yeah. silent. That just works. You know, yeah. if, you, if you're if you ever on a bridge that's really well built, yeah. you never think about, oh, why is this bridge working? You, know, you just enjoy the trip. And mm -hmm. for me, that's what we're trying to build for our health system across yeah. Africa, across, yeah. you know, we're, we're looking at Southeast Asia, we're looking yeah. at South America, we're looking at some European countries, you know, Parts of America, like Titi was mentioning earlier, uh, the goal is to really build infrastructure for the health system across the world in places where infrastructure has not been built, to be that infrastructure that makes it work. And what makes me you know, focus on executing, on scaling the business uh, across this market. I just wanted to just say something about what you said. I greatly admire people who decide that what they want to do is interface with the physical infrastructure of this place like when someone says they're doing so i'm just like wow you have guts like mm. you are you you work hard i i it makes me feel like i'm not even doing you know anything because once you have to think about this there's so many things i admire, I admire your work <laughs> that's, that's just me sorry 
that's the point I was going to get to. Um, and I wanted to ask Titi, building physical infrastructure, we know now, I mean, from obviously being exposed to what these things require, that they are huge undertakings. I mean, to build real, look at the, they've been trying to build real infrastructure I mean, Lagos for more than a decade. You know, but but it still has to be done, right? I mean, it goes hand in hand. The tech infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, it still has to be done. Where it seems like tech is outstripping the physical infrastructure. Is there something we can do from the tech space to help bridge that gap? Um, Titi, what, what are your thoughts on that? In my head, I kept going, absolutely. Tammy tweeted something recently, and she said once she moved back to Nigeria, they were building Lagos Ibarra Expressway, and they're still building it. The number of years you mentioned afterwards, I don't want to out you. <laughs> I can tell you, Tammy, that they've been building that all my life. I have been working in the sector, in the digital sector, for 20 years now. That gives you contact. All my life, there's always been construction on Lagos Ibado Expressway. Mm. Using that very deliberately to respond to your question, that will there ever be a point where there is a need to not do or change or adjust? Mm. No. Right? As long as we have brilliant minds that are bringing the power of technology to solve everyday problems that we know of or that are thinking ahead to create wealth, to respond in the health sector, in the agricultural sector or otherwise, there will always be that need for a shift in the way that the tar on the, on the road is made or for a shift in the way that we actually approach are driving, if we're still driving on that road. To put it very simply, what can be done? I mentioned something, you know, it was a bit on the side, but for me, it's a pet peeve in that I want to be able to see more startups like Timmy and Timmy's coming together, recognizing that your expertise and your response is in a different sector, is in a different space. Hmm. Recognizing that there is that core that connects you together which is technology, whether it's using, and you know, I, I don't think the two of you have ever really sat down together to realize that blockchain actually plays significant roles in both your businesses. But mm. if I ask you immediately, what is the Nigerian government's response to blockchain? Mm. Is there gonna come a time where if power becomes an issue, they will drill down on your ability to be able to power that technology like they mm. did in countries in Eastern Europe? Mm. Or will there come a time where, you know, as you are doing your business, even though it's virtual, they will give the ability for someone to be able to monitor what you are doing. And I look at both your businesses and instantly I'm thinking cybersecurity because you are handling people's money and you're handling people's personal data around health, mm. their personal information. Mm. I immediately think that am I having, as someone who sits and deliberately sits in this space, and I made this choice to sit in the policy space a few years ago because I recognized that nobody was actually sitting to that space. The data protection bill that the Nigerian government through NIMSI just brought out, have either of you actually spent time on it or looked at what the implications are for you, for the financial data that you're holding, or the health data, or even the logistics data that you are sitting on TV with your business? So in that way, that is a real opportunity that I see and that I've, you know, quietly, you know, you were talking about silent infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And this is how it's described to my colleagues at work. Um, mm -hmm. And to anybody who asks me, I say, if you're looking for glory, mm -hmm. if you're looking mm -hmm. to shine, if you're looking for, you know, don't do technology policy work. Because when you're doing policy work, you are mm -hmm. quietly in the background, making sure mm -hmm. that everything is working perfectly mm -hmm. as much as possible for technology to really make an impact in people's lives. Which means that sincerely, um, if I were to, you know, this is actually at some book festival session, if I were to describe it in literary words, you're like the wind, quiet. Mm. Mm. Sometimes you will you whip something up and everybody will get it. Sometimes mm. you will whip something down because mm. you make the wrong decisions and people will know. Mm. So more mm. often than not, it's all around us, but we don't, mm. So I see very much, particularly in the ecosystem that we work on, what we work in, the, the, the environment we're in, on the African continent, specific to Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, etc., 
that if we do not band together and learn to speak, not necessarily with one voice, but in mm -hmm. consensus mm -hmm. around the key issues that are painful mm -hmm. or that stop us from being the best versions of our businesses mm -hmm. or actually limits our ability to be able to grow beyond our borders, mm -hmm. then, you know, we are going to still have this conversation in five years. And sincerely, I don't want to have this conversation in five years. Mm -hmm. I'll be having conversations around how both businesses and other startups have been able to extrapolate, right? Mm -hmm. And build real structures around this impact. Mm -hmm. So for me, those are things that, you know, we need to be able to put in place. Mm -hmm. What's the other thing? And this is the painful part. And there are very few people who will make a decision to take this. It's been a willingness to sit mm -hmm. with government, no matter how frustrating it is. Mm -hmm. And it's frustrating. You know, um, I will say that, you know, there was a period where two different government agencies talking about being able to identify who has money in the bank or not. Mm -hmm. And we can't seem to agree. And all of it is happening on social media. Mm -hmm. Getting to a point where we have government institutions, agencies, parastatals, representatives, who when they speak, they speak in confidence and with knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that I look forward to. The, the willingness to be able to build capacity. And I think, Tammy, you do a bit of this. Mm -hmm. To just spend the time to politely, because we are an African culture, politely educate on why it is critical to do what mm -hmm. you do. And sometimes, and me, I am very good with this, in politely educate on why the decisions that are being taken mm -hmm. is completely obtuse mm -hmm. and does not help. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think we need more of the teamies who are not willing to walk the traditional path to actually mm -hmm. make that Right, mm -hmm. but it can only happen if there's a collective voice. But you know, like me said, some of us are optimists. Yeah, I'm an optimist. Mm -hmm. If you notice behind me, that's a piece mm -hmm. of uh, Ashoki that says Nigeria rocks. Mm -hmm. I've had that mm -hmm. now since 2002, 2003. Mm -hmm. Deliberately made to remind myself. That mm -hmm. even when I'm encountering stumbling blocks that got me, <laughs> right? or even other people's thinking around the use of technology, I've had mm -hmm. all kinds of see the map, Google Maps, for example, that you guys are mentioning. I've had all kinds of nonsense about you know whether it's good, it's bad, or no, it's not good because they will know where you're going. Eh, okay. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> I have chosen mm -hmm. that my generation, our generation will be known for making that difference. In the same way that you think about this generation that to a large extent has given us economic problems, how they mm. let us out of social uh, subservient, you know, with the British colonial masters. Mm. So we need to be able to own this and hopefully mm. we can still at this. Sincerely, hopefully we don't. Interesting point, Titi. Thanks for that. Timmy, let me ask you, um, is there from your interaction, because, you know, like like we said, it's a given, you know, we have to, the physical infrastructure still needs to be built because there's a real cost that imposes um, on your business. Is there a lack of appreciation of what this cost is and, and what the impact is um, from your, just from your engagement or understanding? I, I try to be a little bit more diplomatic um, when, when, when I'm speaking about these things. Everyone always asks me, how do we get people to give blood? Um, and, and I'm like, yeah, you know, it's really difficult sometimes, but you know, my, the way that I've understood the community is people are actually quite given. It's not very obvious, but when you speak to someone and you explain a need that someone has and they feel they can trust you, people are willing to rise to the occasion. Every time I speak to people about the share impact, you know, a few weeks, you know, a few days ago, we celebrated our 10,000. Uh, patients that we help. Wow. We try to count our impact. And every time I tell people, people are really incredibly appreciative of it. However, you know, we've built a business in the private sector. You know, people don't know that because they, they're not, they don't understand how Life Bank works. Mm. You know, 99% of the supply we move goes to private hospitals. So deliberately, I, in the beginning, did not want a situation where the idea would be chasing contracts, mm. you know, <laughs> from, from everywhere. So we genuinely built a fast growing, you know, three X in, four X in revenue every every year um, business on the private health sector in Africa. Now, you know, when you're small and you're year one, year two, year three, year four, that makes sense. 
right? But if you want to, you know, scale your impact and ensure that exponential scale, uh, if I want to get to 10,000 people that we've saved to a million people in a couple of years, I need to go to the public sector and I need mm -hmm. to have these conversations with them mm -hmm. and I need to have these frank conversations with them. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, because that we've done the work, uh, Live Bank works, you know, and we care. Yeah. Yeah. And because we've done the work and we have a track record of five years of 24 yeah. hour service, never shutting down once, never going on break. Literally, we've never shut the door of the office and said, we're going home because someone has to be working. Someone has been working at Live Bank yeah. for yeah. five years, nonstop. Uh, yeah. So because we've built that track record, uh, you know, there is a little bit more openness uh, in terms of in the public sector, listening to right. what we have to say. Uh, okay. Because we're not just newbies, you know, we we sponsor science research. You know, we're opening a testing, a, a science uh, a research center uh, in partnership with Naima very soon. Uh, Naima is Nigerian Institute of Medical Research. So we are opening yeah. sort of like a, a center inside there. We've, you know, built it. Um, uh, to really do medical research uh, using technology and using innovation. Uh, so we've been doing small things like that with recent papers that have been published. Uh, so slowly but surely, we're building that capacity that allows us to get a seat at the table, you know, a very well, you know, honored seat at the table. And I think that's really important. Um, if let's say a year, four years ago, I had, you know, said I wanted to talk to this, you know, commissioner or this minister or this or that, no one would have listen to me, but because we paid our dues and did the work, uh, I think that there's a little bit more openness in, on, in the public sector to listen to how we've been able to build the system and how we can sort of like share what we've done with them. Timmy, so it's taken Timmy five years to get the, them to listen, <laughs> um, but it seems they're listening, right? I mean, there have been guidelines um, that have been released for your, your sector as well. Um, is that a positive thing? Even if it's taking them long, you know, the, the government, I mean, are they coming around? Um, and, and, and what impact do you think that will have on, on all the sectors that we are trying to disrupt or that, you know, technology can enable and disrupt? So generally, uh, with regards to, to the cryptocurrency, I generally don't talk about the government and regulation in public. A lot of it is not yet conclusive right so it's like we haven't decided what the guidelines are but there will be guidelines and let us know who you are yeah. but but Titi, that's a good thing then in terms of the fact that you know we're seeing some movement on the regulatory side because you know entrepreneurs have you know the drive the desire the energy to innovate um, but it seems that government is also trying to keep pace to some degree and, and and you know that that's that has to be a good thing right it is it is a good thing. It could be a bad thing if they're trying to keep pace in an attempt to do some market capture, um, you know, be uh, anti-competitive or begin to play in the same space. And we do have certain governments to do that. Um, uh, a quick comment to Timmy that it's actually a good idea that you spend more time doing the work, um, but also still engaging with these processes, but quietly. I'm a proponent of that. You recall that I said earlier on that, you know, the work that we do, it's not shine, shine. You know, it's not, I mean, you're a bad girl. I always respond to you about, it's not shine, shine, you. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's not something that's all glittering, you know. Um, but the key thing is that the learnings, the experience, what you need to be able to continue to succeed and grow your business, that you're consistently making the public sector, government, whether it's regulatory authorities, or political political appointees are aware in your own way of the impact it has on society. So far, I have been very quiet about mentioning the impact of this technology's direct impact on the end user. You know, on the everyday person, Timmy wants to be able to create wealth. Timmy is doing all she can to actually address a niche problem that we have, not just in Nigeria but across continents. Now, that in itself, for me, is a good reason why government should care. And I think increasingly, again, because the power of technology, they listen more and are just as needed. Going to give this example, it is my word, content tax in Lagos. Seriously, somebody didn't think that through. Mm -hmm. And if people raise their voices, not just those who, um, you know, purportedly have business interest in there, or those like the organization that I work with, Google, where it doesn't touch us directly, but impacts on our content creators, 
but it actually spoke directly to the end user who thought, wait a minute, who is going to be paying for this 5% at the end of the day, right? And it's the same way that a range of human video uh, census boards, not just in Nigeria, in South Africa, in Kenya, they are all looking for ways to innovate as institutions, because I think that's what we also forget, that these are institutions who need to consistently innovate in their approach to regulate in the sector mm -hmm. so that they do not become obsolete. And I can make comments about certain agencies in Nigeria that are looking for that relevance and therefore mm -hmm. are making all kinds of moves. Mm -hmm. The ability for government to be able to continue to respond in a largely positive way is great. Mm -hmm. One of the things I consistently make a case for is that in Nigeria, we need to get better at having what I call sandboxes, innovation mm -hmm. sandboxes, mm -hmm. spaces where you can actually go indicate that, okay, this is likely going to disrupt the sector. I need to be able to do X, Y, and Z, see if it works without the fear of falling afoul of a particular law. And our ability to be able to create that actually will continue to grow the impact of technologies, not just those that are imported from other parts of the world, but all those that, those that are homegrown, that are directly adapted to what, that, what we do on continent. Um, and in that way, um, you know, I've actually spent the last probably two years looking at privacy and trust, and particularly at the health sector, which typically is the last, the very last, to make any adjustments for technology. Mm -hmm. Again, because mm -hmm. Nigeria at stake, X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. followed by it is the financial sector. If you mess with people's money, people will mess with you, right? So looking at those two spaces mm -hmm. and how this is willing <laughs> for governments to rethink the way they are willing to regulate, mm -hmm. right? Not just the way money is moved, but also in the way that we respond to a pandemic like we've had in 2020, mm -hmm. where all of a sudden a country like mm -hmm. Canada embraces and opens up to patients being able to see their doctors virtually even more, right? As opposed to, no, you've got to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one face to face with the, with the client. So mm -hmm. that's the same way that I see that it's a good thing. If there's an enough understanding in the background, mm -hmm. um, and the attempt is not to just try and nip it in the bud, but mm -hmm. actually help it to grow. We're, we're getting towards the end of the session now, so let me just flip this to to the, you know f looking forward. Um, and I, I think let me see. Let me start with Timmy. Given what we know, um, obviously there have been benefits. You know, there have been. It's undoubted that technology has has really improved. Um, quality of life in Africa, you spurred trade and all of that. Um, what what do you want to see moving forward, um, given that we have that fact, uh, but now some of the problems still remain? Moving forward now, what do you want to see and what should happen? What should happen or what should change? What do I want to see? Um, it's really actually very simple and deeply personal to me and it's very narrow a little bit, maybe a bit even niche. What do I want? I want us to be able to develop technology to and develop our, our infrastructure, our healthcare infrastructure, so that should a woman want to give birth, she survives it. And by the way, 80% of all maternal death could be solved. So the, the vast majority of all deaths in childbirth uh, can be really easily you know, remedied. Uh, if we have the right infrastructure, we have the right institution, we have the right healthcare system. So for me, I what do I want to see in my spec sector specifically is to build the infrastructure and the systems that will allow us to deliver health healthcare in an affordable, efficient, and smart way while we're protecting people at the same time ensuring that they survive and they can thrive. For me, I think, what do we need more in our community? I, I've always, I spent a lot of time thinking about Nigeria's problems. And for me, I think what we need across board, we need dignity, you know, we need people to be able to thrive. We need every Nigerian life protected. We need every Nigerian person given the opportunity that they need. We need to be able to live up to our potential across this country. And for me, this is what I want to see on, in a larger space. But more specifically, I believe women should not die in childbirth. And um, my mission is trying to build a system that will ensure that that occurs, where no woman dies in childbirth. Thanks. That's, that's awesome. Uh, Timmy, to you, what can we do differently? I mean, and it's the same problems, not just in Nigeria, it's across Africa, right? Um, so 
uh, whether it's in Kenya, whether it's in, you know, wherever it is, is that something that is within the power of the entrepreneurs to change or does it, do we still have to just keep pushing the government to, to build the infrastructure that we need to enable us to do what we, we do? I think, as always, there are many different ways to do things. And I think that more often than not, when, when there's a change or when there's a flip in the status quo, we, as humans, due to either a short memory or um, an inability to communicate efficiently, we tend to forget just how many different things take us to the point we're going to, right? So there's always something to be said about people pushing the government. There's always something to be said about people wanting to be a part of the government. There's something to be said about people who completely ignore the government and do whatever they want because they have a goal. And in every, like, I guess, ideological tussle, I, I find this to be true where, you know, there are people who are like maximalists and they're like, you know, destroy the system. And then there are people who are like, I want to change it from within and blah, blah, blah. And I find that every one of those different kinds of people are necessary because they offer a unique perspective and they can, they can do certain things that you can't. So uh, prior to starting this company, I really, even just like, I didn't know current affairs. I didn't know what House of Rep was. I'm just someone who is just mass and computer and game, right? So I, I, it's not even something I'm good at, right? But like oh. there are, Kids, are, you know, who grew up with me, who are now, you know, adults, who knew all that stuff, and who, I guess, are either a part of the government or adjacent, and I need them, right? Yeah. And they need me, and you know, vice versa, and, uh, and all those kind of things. So, um, I think everyone should just take one more share, just like, <laughs> uh, yeah, just you know, do your best, to get, give it, you know, wake up and give it the best go you can, and do that again tomorrow. Titi, it's not all on the government, right? The private sector has a role to build infrastructure as well, right? Um, but then, you know, it becomes a, a, a economic, there are economic considerations. Um, they have to, it has, the infrastructure has to be viable, the projects have to be bankable and all of that. What can change in that regard or what needs to change in that regard so that we can, the stock of infrastructure of the continent can improve? So there are a couple of things I'm going to say. One is that, that for there to be change, there has to be enough people enough institutions that care about it, speak about it, to affect that change. This is one of the driving forces for me. I want to be the change I want to see, right? Um, we can all complain. We can all muzzy along and just live with it. It is what it is. Or we can just face our road and just do what exactly it is we want to be able to do. But that is not building anything sustainable for anybody else. So there are a few things that I see that needs to happen. Yes, infrastructure. But infrastructure is completely useless. Built, you know, there's a there's a there's a capital city that was abandoned in Brazil. It was built, has the most beautiful buildings, etc. But nobody prepped the people or prepped industry to be able to go there, right? Mm -hmm. And we also had the same almost had the same case with Abuja. So there are a couple of things that I think need to be in place. We need to address the skills gap, a recognition that there will be many teenies who will make a choice not to finish university from the formal educational sector but who actually have significant things to put into the sector, whatever that sector is, and enable them to be a part of it, a recognition that it's not all about a university education. University education, great, but more often than not, it is more about the skill set that you have to be able to thrive in the time that you're in. We need to be able to address access 100%, and there are many ways in which you know Google does that, but there are many players in that space. Address access, actual infrastructure. Um, right of way that we respond to, no monopolization, like it's happening in certain states in Nigeria. So that's another one. And then there's what I call, and I've been writing about this for the last 20 years, access to access. Put all the internet in place, but if the people don't have the right skills or don't know how to make the best use of it, they will neither know how to be able to manage their money and to turn it to wealth with Chinese business, nor will they be able to know that they actually have access to this life-given force that is the business that's been run by Taney. And I'm just using this too as the examples because they're on this panel. I think finally for me is this. Yes, it's not just about the government. But if you look at it, the one institution, the one sector of society that has the capacity and the ability to be able to shut all of this down mm. with one long proclamation is the government. Mm. So do mm. we throw the baby out with the birthwater? No, we don't. We actually identified the best ways to make sure that you either find the technology so that the backwater does not become so bad and you can actually still use mm. it, 
or you identify mm. getting that baby out so that that baby can continue to thrive. I get asked this question a lot, and I'm going to end up on this note that, you know, why as Google would you fund an Aki Atom book festival? For me, it's a no brainer. I made the choice to be able to support this because I see the value in our literary and art sector. Think about it. As an African anywhere, how do we pass across our message from generation to generation? How do you create the biggest impact? It's through the voice that we can enable. So how can the power of technology enable these voices and give platform to people like you to engage with those who can write about it so that it remains in the consciousness of the end user at all times? Because at the end of the day, the only ones who can actually shift government if we remove our entrepreneurial and business hats is you and I, as citizens, and make a difference. So potentially, maybe I'm looking at the Minister of Health and the Minister of Finance in your space. That was a very strong activist note. Thank you for that. <laughs> so, uh, Temi, I'm just going to go, go around. Any final words, um, any final thoughts you wanted to, to leave us with on this topic? I think that everybody, you know, I love what Timmy said about, you know, there are different people who need to do different things. You know, there are people who are called to different things. Uh, some people are called to enter government. I'm not one of them. Um, <laughs> some people are called to build big businesses. Some people are called to build, you know, all sorts of different things. So we all have to play, play our role. I think what is important is for us, you know, Whoever is listening, either you're in technology or you're thinking of joining technology, I think, what do I want to leave you with? Technology is a tool. It's, you know, clay. You get to build it into what, uh, what change you want to see in the world. And I think that this generation, we have a, an amazing opportunity. The internet um, has given us knowledge like never before. So I think it is really up to us in this generation to really build a new way of doing things on the continent, across the world, to show the next generation who are actually, actually going to end up solving most of the problem, to show them the way, to light the path in this darkness of being African, uh, to, to light the path for them so that they can follow, follow our, our way and actually end up solving the entrenched problems we so despise in our community. I think if there's one thing, it is just, you know, use the internet, use the information that's available to really build this system, to start this process of rescuing our country and our community and our continent from being backwards. And that's all I want to leave you guys with. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Timmy. Timmy, any final words? Yeah, there's pretty much an overlap of what Timmy just said. Um, if you if you are privileged enough to have access to the internet, the things you can do are, are, are limitless. And... Um, do them just yeah see knowledge as as best as you can depending on what your interests are and th there's an impact that you can you can make just because you have privilege to access the internet which you know is not something that most people around us have to to a large extent and is, i don't think it's something we should take for granted so uh, yeah it's pretty much kind of what she said towards the end fine fantastic uh, Titi, I'll just ask you as well, any final word? Um, and then maybe before we drop off, uh, I know you are all prolific uh, social media users. Where can we, where can people read about your work and follow you guys on? Okay, so what do I want to end with? Um, inspire, inform, involve, impact. Once you've picked your lane, let those four words guide you. It does make a difference. We can all work for government. We can all work with government in one way or the other. Where can you find me? For someone who works in technology, I have been very, very shy about using <laughs> Yeah. However, at Titiaki Sumi, as my mentees have told me, stop being social media shy. So at Titiaki Sumi, mm -hmm. where you can find me at the time. Fantastic. And I spend most of my time on Twitter. I really love tweeting. Uh, so you can find me on Twitter at Timi, T E M I T E. Fantastic. Timmy? I do a healthy amount of tweeting. Uh, <laughs> my handle is at Timmy God, T I M I G O D. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for the interesting conversation. And I'm sure we'll keep it going. And um, we'll, we'll probably circle back to this at some point again. Thank you all. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. Sticky, 
I don't know. Oh yeah, I want to go there no. And don't touch me. I will get you arrested. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Very, very easy. Relax, everybody. He shot you. Madness only you can understand. Spectre. Visit myspectre.com to get your Spectre experience. Spectre loans in five minutes. If you ever need a new place to go, you can join me in the world of words. Let me see. I know where to be found If you look, you'll find me in a book Let's take a ride to the past In the back of a phoenix Let's float around the moon You'll never be alone Now you know where to look Find me, find you, find the world We don't just think of ourselves as a bank, uh, we think of ourselves as corporate citizens with responsibility for growing the economy. Reading and education is a key part of it. But equally important is having access to reading materials uh, at home. A lot of the intervention we've done throughout this COVID is to ensure that people can safely navigate the uncertainties of the COVID crisis and come out of it ready for, you know, to leave again. Let's take a ride to the past in the back of a phoenix. Let's float around the moon. The dreams that we have are limited by what we have directly interacted with. What reading does is it makes it possible for you to begin to live in worlds that don't yet exist. One read creates a discipline of reading. One read puts me on the timeline. It gives me an important book and I have an opportunity to read it and to collaborate. It's almost like having someone who does your book selection for you. If you have editors and people who are really good at this saying to you, this is the book for the month, I, I value that. I want to be able to read in a community. I want reading to be a collaborative thing. I want reading to be a communing and one read allows me to do that. I will use one read any day, any time. Stranger's Guide is not a typical American travel magazine. Our mission is to dive deep into a single location, commissioning work from great writers and photographers famous individuals, as well as up-and-coming new voices. This year, we decided to go to Lagos. And we are proud of the volume we produced, with original work from some of Nigeria's best writers and photographers, working with luminaries like Wale Soinka, Molara Wood, and Femi Kute. We think this is a very special volume, and we're so excited to bring it back to Lagos.